Hello, and welcome to the final edition of our masterclass series, Predicting Customer Service in 2023 and Beyond. My name is Sheila McGee-Smith, and I am an industry analyst that has been covering the contact center and customer experience space for over 30 years. I was part of the first uh, of this first session of this uh, four session series, um, which you can go back and watch all of them. But today we're in the final one and we're talking about the predictions. And I have with me two of the executives from Cognigy who has been hosting this series. I'm gonna let each of these gentlemen introduce themselves. First, Hardy, welcome. Hi, Sheila. Great to be here. Excited to be part of the final chapter of this of the series, the Masterclass series. And uh, I'm the SVP of Business Development and Strategy, and uh, looking forward to talking today about how conversational AI is critical to transforming customer service in 2023 and beyond. Excellent. And Sebastian. Hi, Sheila. My name is Sebastian, and I run uh, product marketing for Cognigy. Um, in my side job, I'm a technology evangelist for conversational AI, and in that role, I'm translating between the world of technology and AI on the one hand, and the users, the applications, the market, and also sales and marketing, of course, on the other hand. So thanks for having me. Excellent. I love that term evangelist, because conversational AI is certainly still in that phase where we need evangelists. We Customers and, and enterprises you know, want to understand more about how they can bring this technology into their own enterprises. So first thing we're going to talk about is who is Cognigy? So they've been hosting this series, but they are also a, a leader in providing conversational AI. So where did they come from? Um, then we're going to talk about why automation has become such a topic in 2022, and certainly as we look ahead. We're going to talk about how the evolution of customer journey fits into conversational AI and how that definition has changed over the last probably 10 years or so. Um, Sebastian is going to share some great innovations that are coming in conversational AI and how they will be weaved into uh, existing applications and new applications over time. We're going to talk about uh, knowledge management and how we take, you know, what in the past has been sort of a static, almost a static kind of a technology and bring that into the everyday experience of an agent. Finally, we're gonna talk about the ethical use of data, right? Um, when we talk about conversational AI and we talk about, you know, having information that we use to, to personalize interactions with customers, there are sometimes customers and companies who have concerns about that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll each have a, a final thought to sum us up. So let's start. Who is Cognigy, Sebastian? Uh, where did it come from? Where did it come from? Well, that is a, it is a relatively long story in the industry, even though the company is only six years old. But um, maybe let me answer with a bit of a personal view on who the company is, what we do, and why we love what we're doing. So um, in my career, I've always followed two passions. One is linguistics. Um, so looking at the question on why is language so complex uh, on, the, on the one hand, and at the other hand, so easy to use for everybody without thinking about it. How does it work? What, what are the inner mechanisms that make it so powerful, right? And the other passion has always been computer science. So for me, it was almost like a natural career path to look into conversational AI um, at some point of my career. So when I joined Cognigy um, about three years ago, I found one aspect really most remarkable about the technology and also about the whole industry. So first of all, the underlying technology is truly amazing. And the progress that AI as the centerpiece has made in the past two decades, so since that notorious um, AI winter, that is absolutely stellar. Um, and even three years ago, what was possible was absolutely mind blowing. But on the other hand, as a consumer, uh, I felt that most bots, voice and chat are actually really, really bad. Those were not providing great experiences. And quite frankly, there are still many bad bots out there, right? They don't understand, they don't help. They feel like they're there to deflect and not to provide great service. So 
there is a huge gap between the art of possible in conversational AI and what is actually implemented and deployed to production. And I think that is really where Cognigy sits and where is, that is where the sweet spot is um, of what we're doing. We're developing technology for voice and chatbots that's not for demos. It's not designed to you know, just impress on the happy path, but to actually work at scale and in practice with many of the largest organizations in the world. And that is really what drives also our, our purpose or our mission. Um, we say our mission is to uh, create customer and employee service that is loved by everyone. So we're not just looking at automating services um, with conversational AI. It's about empowering teams to make these experiences work. It's about giving non-IT people the tools they need to make their initiative successful and also about augmenting service workers. We're gonna speak about that in one of the later chapters, I believe. Um, so what was three years ago for me, very, very evident is that Cognigy is on a fantastic path to make all of that work. Uh, it hasn't been a big company back then when I joined. So it was a bit of an adventure for me, um, but now uh, 2022, we were named a leader in the Gartner Magic Quadrant for enterprise conversation AI platforms. And we're successfully deploying projects all over the world. So virtual agents are working with many of the largest companies in the world uh, based on our clients. And that's something that makes me uh, personally really proud and it's also a great achievement by Cognigy and uh, by their founders, of course. Excellent. So one of the things that you talked about there, Sebastian, is bringing this technology um, across the world globally. And that's part of what Hardy is involved in. So tell us how Cognigy brings this technology to enterprises, Hardy. Great, Sheila. Thank you. Yeah. And not surprisingly, um, as Sebastian highlighted, we started in the German speaking regions and have gotten tremendous traction with both partners and direct in, with uh, large enterprises. And I think Sebastian is going to talk about some of the transformative uh, deployments of our technology and some of those customers today. Um, and what's happening is at the at the same time that we've been we were focusing on building up our reputation, our reference customers, et cetera, in those regions, um, the rest of the world was starting to, as Sebastian highlighted recognize the value of this technology and the criticality of it. So what our focus is over the next 24, 36 months, um, and really just now heading into mainstreaming is aligning with key technology partners that are delivering, <clears throat> that are supporting and delivering these technology solutions into the largest uh, enterprises in the world and, and, and getting Cognigy as part of the critical technology solution set that's creating really powerful outcomes that we're gonna talk about throughout the course of this, uh, this conversation. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, we'll have lots more to say as we continue. And, and back to what Sebastian was saying about some of the great companies that Cognigy works with, we'll be hitting on some of those as we talk as well. So why is this such a hot topic right now? Okay. So mm -hmm. why is automation happening in so many companies right now? And we almost have to refer to some of the economic uncertainty that's happening in the world. Um, that combined with set, you know, the, the notion of hybrid work and great resignation and quiet quitting, the, the, the tie between people who work in companies and the service they provide has never been more tenuous. So companies are, are striving to figure out how do I create better service? And one of those ways you know, I see automation, but I also think self-service. How do we make self-service better? Because as we know, customers would rather self-serve. That's how they typically start. So how do we make that even better? So I'm going to hand it off to Sebastian to talk a little bit more about why automation is happening now. Yeah, um, thanks, Sheila. I, in my eyes, there are three main drivers um, that... Um, push the world towards automation and towards better self-service. And I think the most important driver of all of these is that customer experience is now more important than ever. Customers are much more impatient. They are much more demanding than they might've been a few years ago. They are using many, many more channels 
right? They're not willing to figure out where's the website, where's that form, where do I find that number that I can call? You know, they, they want the same experience they have with their phone when texting their families and friends. It's taking the shortest path to resolution without having to think too hard and having to reverse engineer what kind of server, service experience an enterprise envisioned, right? They also expect much faster reply times. Nobody would be willing to wait for an answer two, three days on an email, right? Even though that still happens in a lot of cases. And I think they are also much less forgiving when experiences are really bad. So a good example for me is the airline industry where airlines spend millions and millions on ads and on brand building and all of that to be attractive and highly regarded. And I remember very well, 12 months from now, there was some sort of severe weather incident around um, Thanksgiving in the US and, uh, Papers back then were full, not about the fact that flights were canceled, but about the fact that many people spent their nights waiting on the phone line trying to get hold of a service agent. So there have been, uh, and it has been a huge amount of terribly bad experiences in the context of transportation, and that has nothing to do with the actual product or the legroom or the price. This is purely a customer service train wreck that damaged the brand reputations back then. And that's very, very hard to compensate with more ads and more brand building. But it doesn't really have to be like that, especially in the airline sector. There are means and ways to make this work in a much better way without having to sit through the night for eight or 12 hours until you can speak to a service rep to um, kind of rebook your flight. And the second mega trend that is driving automation, so coming back to your, to your main question is, Providing these experiences that work is harder than ever, especially with manual labor. You've mentioned the topic of labor shortage. There's also um, agent churn, for example, which in my eyes was the number one topic that was discussed on CCW when I joined there, there uh, earlier this year. Quite quitting is a, is, a, is a topic. The great resignation is another buzzword we've been talking about a lot. And, you know, in all honesty, those agent jobs are probably not the easiest jobs in the world, but many of them are not very well paid. So it's hard to retain the staff and train them on time and keep the staff working to provide those great experiences. And the final fact that drives automation right now really into the mainstream of customer service is that the technology is there. Um, in the past years, um, there has been sometimes a bit of um, a hype around service automation which wasn't quite ready. So AI was often pitched by many stakeholders as a magic black box that you plug in and it serves all your needs. It magically does its job and it makes everything better, but that's not how it works. So beyond the hype, there's now that plateau of productivity and that is where customer service automation sits right now. The technology is mature, it's integrated, and it's usable, right? It, it works at scale and it's no longer just an IT thing. And that is really what drives it into the mass market of uh, contact center software. And Sheila, if I could just add one comment, you know, we're seeing in many use cases, back to um, Sebastian's comment about uh, taking load off the agents, the ability to automate some of the more uh, mundane tasks that they're having to do, which frees them up to do more rewarding work which as we all know, agent engagement, agent experience is a critical driver to retention. So it's really, um, we've seen it at scale, having a tremendous impact on agent engagement um, and satisfaction as a result of removing some of these more mundane tasks they have to do. So let me go back to you, Hardy, and ask, how do uh, enterprises think about financing, uh, paying for these? How cost-effective are conversational AI project. Yeah, um, and this is a great point, and this goes, certainly ties right to the economic comment that Sebastian made as well, where we are today. Um, you know, the expectation is that these are going to have an ROI, um, and it's going to deliver it in a relatively uh, short period of time. And so what you're seeing with the, with the use cases at scale is a very significant return on investment in a very short period of time as a result of um, reducing the amount of labor, handle time, some of the traditional contact center metrics that we're all very familiar with that are in the contact center space. Um, the ability to automate certain of these tasks and certain of these flows has a tremendous impact on not only those efficiency metrics of the contact center, but also in measurable CSAT returns, all the NPS and customers that other methods of, of measuring customer satisfaction. So it, it, it makes it relatively easy to finance it because we can demonstrate very significant short-term economic returns to the, to the uh, decision makers of the enterprise. 
So one of the things that I see and I, I hear with companies that I work with is they will do this kind of a project with a, a fairly limited scope, you know, a very specific task they want to automate. But what they find with success is that those projects really expand quickly, right? So what happens to the finances with respect to that? I mean, is it is um, is it should companies think about the multitude of, of things that they could do or should they think and, and focus on that first project? I'll let Sebastian take a shot at this as well. But my, my view is, is that um, outcome based uh, projects are really good, a really good way to start in this space. And we've seen a lot of customers who've done that start with a very specific problem they're trying to solve for their uh, for their customer experience or context in their organization. And they have such great success. They then move on to two or three of the other uh, examples that we can deploy within the contact center. And then uh, that ultimately turns into an enterprise-wide adoption of technology for both external and internal facing um, uh, solutions. So it ends up being a really powerful long-term relationship. And the economics are, are it's, it's effectively in some ways self-funding, if you want to think of it that way, where the return is so powerful that um, there isn't an issue within the organization to making additional investments uh, into the technology. Sebastian, did you want did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you really nailed it there. Um, maybe the one thing to add is that a, a good practice to start and to identify good use cases for the technology is to look at where is a Pareto distribution of recurring requests, recurring tasks, um, and um, tasks that can be automated. Right. So if you if you look at the at the the ten percent of let's say customer inquiries that are responsible for eighty percent of the um, incoming traffic into the contact center, that is a great point to start with automation and uh, that is probably where the lowest hanging fruits are and where there's the shortest time to ROI. From there, it is easy to extend to go into broader use cases, which will then um, provide better service also in, in those use cases. But the starting point is really where are the recurring cases and what is easy to automate. And when you see, when you look at these use cases, uh, Sheila, you see incredible value as Sebastian highlighted for certain deployments to technology in a very short period of time. So, and that's what's important, as you know, is speed to value when it comes to new, new technology adoption. And, and we can point to several examples of that, um, that where, where customers have, have gone that path and have had that return. Right, and we're gonna be getting to those. So as I think about what you've just been saying about starting with very outcome-based, very perhaps simple kind of interactions that have a lot of, uh, of volume, um, I think about how that impacts how customers are now experiencing customer service, right? The journeys have changed so dramatically over the last few years. Uh, it used to be you would, you know, you would call in, you know, you'd be on one channel. Um, now you definitely start in some kind of a digital engagement of some kind. You start on Google, you may start with chat. And so now we're asking automation to be part of a different kind of a journey, one where we may go from, you know, human service to machine service, machine to human handoffs. So how is conversational AI prepared to help with companies trying to handle this really diverse customer journey that customers are on? And I'm going to start with you here, Sebastian. Yeah. Um... Excellent question. And I think you're absolutely right about the fact that the journeys and the expectations have dramatically shifted. Um, so I think, first of all, we all know that the relatively easy tasks are never handled in the contact center these days. They're handled via Google. Nobody would call to ask for an opening hour or for anything that sits on the website. If that can be found with a, you know, with, with a simple search string in Google or wherever, then that is answered. So I think the complexity of inquiries that go into the contact center is relatively high compared to 10, maybe 15 years ago. So everything is a lot harder to solve. Um, and you're also right that customers tend to turn to different channels to get their questions, to get their questions answered. Probably calling is not the first choice for many demographics for some they still are but digital messaging might be a preferred channel so 
conversation AI can definitely help there, first of all, in enabling customers to not have that robotic, unpersonal experiences that they have had with a chatbot maybe a few years ago. But on a chat or on a voice bot, we can welcome the customer on a service line or in a digital chat, and uh, we allow them to express their needs and their wishes in natural language rather than follow, let's say, a touchstone menu or following a, a rigid menu structure. And then based on the information that the customer is given, we make a contextualized, personalized decision on what is happening with that service request. So based on dozens of parameters, which can include like the, the customer tier, the type of intent that the customer has, um, the time of the day, or the region where the customer are calling or texting from, we can decide, is that inquiry handled with a human agent or is it handled by a self-service, right? And based on that, we allow the waiting times to be much shorter than before. And we also, as Hardy pointed out earlier, uh, we relieve the agents from handling all the repetitive tasks that some of them might be handling 10, 20, or maybe even 100 times a day. And a good example here is identification and verification. That is so simple and so straightforward, no human uh, should be needed to doing that. That can be perfectly handled by the machine. And, in a, and by the way, this is also better from a security standpoint, right? When you don't, let, when you don't share your, 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 um, your credentials or whatever is needed to log in with a human, but with a machine, that can be treated um, like in, in a kind of a physical safe way according to regulations and according to security specifications. But after all, conversational AI can really, can really um, augment the underlying processes in a way that humans can focus on what they are really good at, which is, for example, showing empathy, understanding and fixing hard problems, helping the customer um, in, a, in, a, in a pleasant and um, um, embracing way, whereas the machines can take over the not so critical tasks, the repetitive tasks, the easy parts. And all of that leads to a shorter path to resolution and a better customer experience at the end. So we've been talking about the technology. Let's talk a little bit about you know, specific types of use cases that Cognigy has worked with, with the customers that they have, where we see this change in terms of the customer journey. Sebastian? Yeah, sure. Um, so in terms of um, giving some customer examples on what's happening really in practice, I guess one of the um, the most impressive projects is working with one of the largest airlines in the world on improving their services. And what the technology does in their case is that it safely identifies a customer requests, and then it does an intelligent routing um, based on the question, is this something that an agent needs to handle or is it something where self-service is the better fit? And um, that enables that airline to deal much, much better with peak load because machines can scale almost indefinitely. We've seen peak loads of more than 10 thousand concurrent chats coming in in those cases and a, tech, a platform like Cognitive AI can easily handle those peaks and um, make sure that the wait times don't get too long for those customers if agents become un unavailable due to a high peak load. What is also important about the technology is that it cannot just make this decision and do an intelligent routing. It can also do things that no human agent could do before. And one example is providing real-time translation. So what we also see in production is that incoming chats in the language of the customer are translated in real time by AI to the first language of the agents. Right? Mm -hmm. So the agents don't have to necessarily speak the customer's language in order to, to provide support in the customer's language, because the answer is also translated in real time. So you could chat to, you could chat, let's say in German to an English speaking agent who doesn't speak German, their reply would be translated back. We give a little indication of the fact that machine translation has happened in the meantime, in, you know, in, in the meantime, just to make sure that nobody is kind of scared by the tonality that sometimes may not be may not be hit 100%. Mm -hmm. But after all, the result is a much better experience for people who are not able to switch maybe to, to English to talk to an English, um, English speaking agent. So there's a lot of things that happen on top the technology enables that just leads to much better service experiences. So Hardy, one of the things that that's coming out during this conversation is you know, Cognigy began in Germany. They're now much more global. Talk to me a little bit about how that's happening, 
right? I don't know how you're you're gaining customers around the world because of the reputation that you've built, and perhaps maybe a little bit about how the Cognigy's um, abilities with various languages, right? And and where you start as a as sort of a, a European company company that has has to deal with so many different languages in such a small geographic area, how sure. that has become such a you know such a an important part of the Cognigy story. Yeah. So I think the first point is clearly language is a first class citizen on the on the platform. So uh, we take language very seriously. Support um, literally a hundred different languages on the platform, and um, and so we're able to deploy in all the main regions of the world uh, very successfully. Um, we've got large enterprise scale deployments, uh, you know, in, in Europe, in, the, in North America, um, in the Middle East, and, and also in Asia. So, so very, very successful. And the focus right now, as you know, Sheila, and you mentioned it is, you know, with our leadership in the Gartner Magic Quadrant, which is viewed by all large enterprises as a critical part of their reference uh, documentation as they're looking for new solutions, we've had really, really robust interest, um, both, in the, uh, both on the US side or the North American side, as well as the other regions. And in North America, what we're seeing is adoption at the high end of the market with the largest contact centers in, in, the, in, in some of the largest contact centers in the world, and um, very, very high level of interest on, on solving the problems that we just talked about around personalization and creating effortless experiences for customers, both digitally and then as necessary, digitally and with human uh, interaction. Interesting. So a lot of what we've been talking about is the innovation that has come to conversational AI over the last maybe five years, you know, three of them with Sebastian, but there were some other people <laughs> before that. <laughs> um, but when I talk to companies as they choose their vendors for projects, especially something as sophisticated as conversational AI, one of the things that they're looking for is innovation. They don't necessarily want what you have today, that that's important, but they also want to make sure that what they are investing is, is, is future-proofed, that you're going to continue to be innovative. And so what I'd like you to talk about, Sebastian, is what's coming in terms of innovation with respect to conversational AI? Yeah, um, I totally agree with you that innovation is a big driver also of the demand for conversational AI. People want to make sure that when they buy into a platform and not just a one trick pony product, you know, like a like a like a point solution, that um, they decide for a technology that will not only make them successful today, but that will let them participate on the advancements of AI and of the technology in general that are coming down the road. Um, even though the technology is pretty mature, there are quite a few areas where there's a lot of development happening. And um, you know, I can I can just pick out a few. One of the um, most important ones is definitely the use of large language models. So maybe you've seen uh, some of the text or even artworks that has been created by products like uh, OpenAI or Cohere or others. So it is AI, not just to understand customers, but also to customize and create responses and insights on the fly in real time. That technology has a huge potential for automation. It also has a huge potential for things to go wrong. So you have to be really careful how to deploy that technology. What are the right use cases for AI generated content and what use cases are not good use cases. But that is definitely something where we where we see a lot of the future of innovation happening. And um, we're very active in our R&D department to bring these sort of technologies into the product and into production um, as soon as uh, they really make sense for the customers and help them deliver better services. But to, to be a bit you know, less futuristic about AI, um, a few other trends that are important to note are, for example, proactive engagement. Today, most customer service is very reactive. And if companies reach out to, to customers, it's mostly to try to sell them something, right? Um, but the idea of proactive services is to start an interaction even before a problem occurs. and. A very simple use case for that is in government where authorities uh, could reach out with a text and say, hey, we notice your driver's license or your ID is going to ex will expire in less than three months. Click here to schedule an appointment for renewal. So those use cases are already in practice, and that is really perceived as a great service. Um, another example of one of our customers who does that uh, in the B2B space is Toyota. 
uh, Toyota is known for very reliable cars and also great service. Um, but even with the most reliable cars, sometimes, you know, in the most reliable cars, something might go wrong. So we built an integration together with Toyota from the onboard electronics of the car into a conversational AI instance so that when the engine warning light flashes on, there is a call triggered to a vehicle to the vehicle owner. That's not necessarily the driver. That's important to notice. It's the vehicle owner who should know what is going on. And they receive a call saying, we noticed there's this engine information coming up. You should visit the next workshop. Uh, let me connect you to an agent to schedule something at your nearest convenience. And that is also something that is perceived as great services. And it results in a win-win situation because the vehicle owners are notified ahead of time of something that might happen in the future. And they are being uh, relieved from that burden of now figuring out the dealer's number, getting in touch with them. All of that is happening proactively for them. And finally, oh, another. Sorry, sorry Sheila. No, I, I, well, I'm going to break in and just say I'm waiting for my brand new 2023 Toyota CRV. And so I'm happy to hear that there's going to be these great services available and I don't know how to use them, but finish your thought. Let's, let's hope you'll never see that warning light flashing, right? <laughs> so I, I'd rather want you not to get that call, even though we're very proud that that does happen. That is uh, working very successfully. <laughs> um, the, the, the final trend I wanted to mention or final innovation trend, which is related a bit to the Toyota case is um, that uh, we, um, everybody's looking to build much more integrated journeys than ever before. Mm -hmm. So customers, they really dislike being handed from one channel to another, or even from agent to agent. And what they dislike most is having to repeat themselves. So what technology today does, and we're going to see more of that in the future, is how we can almost merge experiences on different channels into one coherent service experiences, service experience. So an example could be an interaction that starts within WhatsApp. It then is handed over to a phone call, then includes an SMS for authentication, and then returns to a device like a mobile phone to use the device sensors, like for example, the camera to take a picture and send that off to an agent. So instead of going from silo to silo, we see how all of these different touch points are merged together into one coherent journey. And that is gonna make service experiences much faster, much frictionless than ever before. One other comment I just wanted to make and ask uh, Sebastian to elaborate on us. And I don't think of this as customer facing so much, but as in speed to outcome for the enterprises, is Sebastian, maybe you can touch a little bit about uh, all the innovation that Cognacy has done around extensibility, um, of, you know, speed to deploy from the platform standpoint. So the number of integrations to channel, you mentioned digital channels and multimodal. Talk a little bit about how, from a platform standpoint, um, that technology can be stitched together very quickly to deploy. Yeah, uh, very good point. Um... I think what is what I've also mentioned earlier is that the platform is only as good as people bring it into action. And we have extensively worked to kind of pre-build and pre-configure as much as possible for the enterprise to really bring their technology to life in a fast way. Uh, one example are pre-made channels into all the digital touch points and also in the existing contact center infrastructures that are out there to tap into the power of the technology. Because if an automation initiatives, initiative, uh, if it should start with a six month integration project, who would be up for doing it, right? The, the time for, for value would be much too long. So Cognigy's way is really to look into turnkey integrations into contact center infrastructure as well as the channels. So that is the customer facing end. But equally important is the back end. So the, the enterprise back end, all the systems of record where data lives, where customer data is stored, and where things can be actually done. Be because without a back end integration, a bot is only an FAQ bot. It might be able to answer some questions, but it can never do something on, the, on behalf of the customer. So based on um, pre-made backend integrations into CRM and CMS and ERP systems and ITSM systems and so on, also legacy systems with many enterprises, we are able to build transitional bots that start with the plug and play integrations into channels and go deep into the backend systems and finally enable the customer 
to to do something in self service all with natural language all without having to understand what is going on in those in those back end systems behind the scenes but just in a frictionless and easy and natural experience so sebastian um, you know clearly rpa and cai are working alongside each other in the contact center today uh, with our agent assist technology i think is a good example where you see those two technologies working together perhaps you could elaborate a little bit on that um, for the audience yeah, absolutely. So um, conversational AI and RPA can really be a dream team because uh, as you elaborated, RPA is super strong at automating things, also things that were never meant to be automated. So it's very strong into plugging into backends and pulling strings and writing data and, and kind of transforming data. Whereas conversational AI has that interface to the end customer. It has that language interface, but can also make use of other channels or, or other sources. And a good example is a document processing. And that is a good use case in self-service, but it's an even better use case, as you mentioned, in the contact center when there has been um, an agent handover hap uh, happening, right? So once a human speaks to the human, we can plug in RPA technology to, for example, have an end customer take a picture of a document that picture is sent over to an RPA bot, which processes it, extracts the right information. And those informations are filled into a form that sits right on the agent screen. So that relieves the agent, of course, from manually typing from a photo um, uh, and uh, makes sure the data quality is much better and speeds up the process um, by a factor of 10 or so. So the, the, the use cases for RPA and specifically document understanding, document processing are virtually limitless, especially in the contact center. Excellent. So this actually brings us to our next topic pretty seamlessly. So we talked earlier about uh, issues with churn and retention and motivation of agents uh, in what can be a less than interesting job sometimes. So I think one of the ways that um, contact centers are supporting agents is with knowledge management, right? With knowledge management systems. But I think what we're finding is conversational AI can be a nice plug between knowledge management and the agent using agent assist technologies. So we touched on that a little bit just now, uh, Sebastian, but can we sort of broaden that to say, you know, a lot of people think of conversational AI as just the bots, but a whole portion of this is also how do we enable and empower agents with agent assist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I totally agree with you. Um, I, I don't think we should we should ever take a position that self-service or conversational AI can replace human agents. That's absolutely not the case. I think a, a good virtual agent should always kind of know its limits and hand over to human agent to the best possible moment with as much context as mm -hmm. possible. And the 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 um, if you will the market for agent assist and for human agents is incredibly large. I've just read that. Uh, there are 17 million service workers or contact center agents in the world, 17 million, right? That is about the same population as the Netherlands in total. <laughs> that is how many human agents are in the world. And these are and a lot of them are in the Netherlands. <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them, but some of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and many of them are are literally wasting time with repetitive laborious tasks that machines are better at doing. And we can take those tasks and kind of handle them upfront by the machine. Identification verification is a good example. But like I said, the main goal of conversational AI should never be to deflect customers, but to maximize the quality of the service experience. And that often includes a handover and a, an early handover without a long waiting time. So after that handover happens, the, the first thing that conversation AI can do is provide what's called a warm handover. So before even taking the call, the agent understands who is calling, why are they calling, what are they calling about, ideally what has been the history of that customer. And in many cases, they will also get an idea of the sentiment. So they can kind of mentally prepare, is this someone who is just having a casual inquiry or is it someone who's really mad because they have already been let down by some service experience before and they can react based on that kind of um, identified sentiment that has been um, 
presented through agent assist tools. Um, you've spoken of knowledge base retrieval. That is indeed a big use case also for conversational AI, because what conversational AI can do is kind of quietly listen in the conversation and based on all available data points, fetch pieces of information and present it to the agent in real time without them having to do, let's say, an online search in a knowledge base or something. So while the customer is still asking a question based on the intent, based on keywords um, that are in, in, in that customer expression, conversational AI can fetch the perfect knowledge base article presented to the agent on the screen and the agent can then read it out or get inspiration from it on how to help the customer. But, uh, I, um, I, sorry, Sheila. I was gonna say, I have a great example of this personal example where I was talking to my healthcare provider about mm -hmm. something you know, uh, whatever, scheduling something. And then I remembered I was leaving for a trip internationally and I would be in mm -hmm. three countries. And I, I pivoted the conversation very dramatically to mm -hmm. say, what is my coverage when I'm in Morocco and London and Ireland? Mm -hmm. And I can just imagine that agent, right, who's trained on a certain set of interactions, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I could almost hear her and, you know, fumbling for how do I <laughs> pivot to find this information? And again, a great use case of if conversational AI is listening and hears what is actually a fairly straightforward question, right? This is this person, this is her coverage. These are the countries. We can feed that information to her, fetch it for her. So I think there are great use cases out there and I'm, I can't wait to see those coming true. Yes, totally. And that is exactly what happens. In your example, the conversational AI would identify the case and it would identify the countries mentioned. And based on that, it would make an intelligent suggestion of what is the best hit in the knowledge database. And it would bring that right up to the screen. Um, but it doesn't even have to end there because in many cases, and I'm not sure about your service inquiry, but in many cases, the agent now has to do something. They, for example, need to extend your the coverage of your travel insurance to more countries. So it's not enough to just read something out, but the agent now needs to act. And one of the biggest challenges in the contact center is that in order to act, those agents need to be trained in using a number of subsystems. And it can be 10 or 15 different UIs, different tools that those agents have to use. But remember, I've spoken earlier about the backend integration of Cognitive AI. And we can leverage that backend integration not only for automation, but also for the human agents. So instead of, instead of just giving the agent the information of your next step should be to extend the coverage, right? So a suggestion of the next best action, we can enable that right within the UI. So the agent would get a message that says, click here to extend the travel coverage, the, the to extend the travel coverage for your customer um, and make it happen right now. So they never have to leave their contact center UI they're working in. They never have to leave the agent assist system. They can act right within the tool and based on the backend integration that is now being processed in the backend systems. So it's next best action, not just as a suggestion, but really as an actionable tool right on the agent screen. And that can make, of course, a huge difference in terms of you know, speed of handling and service quality. Now, this is a great, another great example of innovation, even though we're not specifically talking about that at this moment. As we talk about things like healthcare and, and looking at people's personal coverage, the question of the ethical use of data comes up and, and companies worrying how will customers feel about, you know, um, conversational AI making decisions based on information. How is Cognigy, how does that handle those kind of issues with their customers, Hardy? Yeah, so there's really two elements to it from my perspective. One is the mandatory, let's call it uh, ex external requirements uh, to support specific use cases in specific verticals. So HIPAA compliance is an example, SOC 2 certification for security, things like that. So that's when you're looking at it for an enterprise conference AI platform, those are, I'm going to call them table stakes. Those are expectations of any enterprise uh, IT slash customer experience organization that you're going to be able to meet those requirements. The other issue becomes, and this goes back to your question about you know, global expansion, there are different requirements um, in different geographies for different levels of end user data retention. 
And so, um, you know, Sebastian, perhaps you can elaborate a little bit on the strength and flexibility of our platform relative to the ability to um, control uh, end user data um, based on customer, uh, literally customer uh, specific requirements. Yeah, that is um, definitely a standard requirement that we have in many customer implementations. And, uh, you know, being a European country is, um, you know, sometimes a bit of a curse because the regulations are super tight in terms of what you can do with the data, what you can store. And that might be even harder with some specific companies that have tighter regulations than the government regulations are. Um, but with that background and if that with that history of our product, we have very early on implemented very granular mechanisms to uh, control the usage of data and the storage of data from the database level up to the UI level. So uh, any organization can specify how much how much data do they want to store and log and maybe benefit from data-driven insights versus how much data protection needs to happen in a specific use case. And that, of course, is um, always um, a, a relevant factor. In healthcare environment, the data is probably much more sensitive than, let's say, in an FAQ bot that um, you know just sits on a website and helps about opening hours. Uh, we have a, a scope of customers that you know ranges from retail companies with um, you know not very critical questions up to pharmaceutical companies like BioNTech, um, makers of the of the COVID vaccine, together with Pfizer in the U.S. Um, and the BioNTech bot, of course, is highly sensitive in terms of not processing any personal information or not giving out information that might be critical. So the amount of control that customers can have both on kind of exposed data to the end customer as well as um, storage data about the end customer coming from the end customer is virtually limitless with the platform. Excellent. So I think we are ready to, to wrap up with some final thoughts. If you've been with us and you're listening to this last hour, you've heard about innovation, you've heard about global deployment, you've heard about a lot of success, you may be thinking, how do I get started? You know, what should I do next? And we're going to answer that real quickly. Each of us are going to give you ideas on how to get started quickly as we head into 2023. So let me start with you, Sebastian. Yeah, so um, first of all, I want to repeat that um, what I said in one of the first questions, which is the time to act is really now. The, the technology is there and you don't have to start with the big projects with hundreds of people, but you need to assemble the right team to look into use cases, explore what is really worth starting with, with what has the biggest ROI for a conversational AI use case and get things going. You can start as early as a few weeks. You can play around with a, with a free trial before you gain experiences in production. And you can um, you should really start getting the, the right team assembled to build a prototype, to build almost like a lighthouse project that can then serve as a gateway to a much broader uh, rollout and uh, production implementation of conversational AI. But it's really easy to start. Excellent. Hardy. Yes, I would echo exactly what Sebastian said. Now, it, this technology is ready now. Um, CogniG is one of the leaders in the space, um, and we're very excited about delivering these solutions to customers. As we've highlighted, you should pilot, um, you should expect to pilot technology. And as Sebastian, I think, very uh, correctly said, uh, pick some high value target use cases, get going now. Don't try to you know, do a, you know, long-term project, think about a short-term project that delivers significant value in your customer experience journey transformation. And what I will say is that Sebastian talked about 17 million agents, right? My number is 15, so we can agree to disagree, but of that 15, <laughs> <Close> enough. <laughs> of that 15 million or so, um, probably 70% still work behind premises-based contact center solutions. And yes, it's great to be in the cloud and, and uh, get innovation from the cloud, but in order to get started, you don't have to be in the cloud. So Sebastian also talked about all the integrations they have to existing contact center solutions. A lot of them are premises solutions. They have plenty of customers that are working with prem solutions. So don't worry about the fact that you're on a premises solution today. You can start your conversational AI journey there, and then move it to the cloud, 
when you're ready to move to the cloud. So wonderful conversation. Thank uh, Hardy, you're a little tough, you know, breaking in every once in a while, but you know, I'll, I'll give you a pass. Uh, Sebastian, great job. Um, we want you, if you haven't yet, to go back and watch the first three of the master classes. Um, I was part of the first one. Um, the third one was fantastic. Um, it was a, a, a customer who um, did a really good story about how they deployed Cognigy through their enterprise over a series of years. And that was Eon, the, the energy company. And the second one was, was Brian Cantor from CCW, who also did a ter terrific job. So I want to thank you for attending. And I'm going to send you back to the other three master classes and head into 2023 with conversational AI and Cognigy. Thank you.